Hey, George, wake up. Who, what, what time is it? It's time for the next episode of Graveyard Cars. Let's go, let's go. Okay. We interrupt this program to inform you of what transpired on the last episode of Graveyard Cars. My name is Brenda Kellison. I'm a pinstriper. Mark gave me the opportunity to letter the little dead wagon, um, his version of the little red wagon, and so I couldn't pass it up. Uh, Doug and I are working on getting the engine mounts in position. I've already pre-mocked all this stuff up, so now it's just a matter of putting it on the engine and getting it ready to go in the A100. It's not just a matter of dropping it in there like it is on some cars or just dropping the car down around it like we do on the other cars. God, I've got a bad feeling about this. So the doors are all assembled. We got the locks, the handles, we got the latch assemblies in, the new weather strips. With all that done, that really allows us to button up a good majority of that cab. This particular case, this is a true unibody. The frame rails are built into it like a unibody would have, but everything in it, the framework for the instrument panel and for the radio, the things that will bolt into it that'll make it a street functionable unit, they're actually welded into the body itself. So I can't take those out and put them in a sandblaster and blast them all up and make them pretty. Will had to do all that stuff in place. To be able to move forward with getting the rest of the interior in the truck, we've got to be able to put the back window in. It's going to be up to our team to get it installed. So with these back glasses, you don't have to urethane them in. They, they just really set into place and the molding holds it into place. So therefore we can just do it ourselves. Back glass is in, looks great. We had it tinted so we can move on to the next step. The windshield installation, uh, way past my pay grade. That's very, very precise work. This is a dual windshield with a split. So if you look at it, you got a right hand windshield, left hand windshield, and then you got a nose piece down the middle. Putting all that together and not breaking one of those pieces of glass with less than four days to have the car ready to go to SEMA, not my idea of fun. So that's done, it looks absolutely gorgeous. That's a huge thing to have out of our way. Because with that out of our way, we really just have a few things left and we can load that thing on the truck and head off to the show. So firing up the uh, Mopar Performance Ray Barton 923 horsepower Hemi, I thought I'd have a little fun. Will, if it's going to leak, it's yes. going to be out these back bowls right here. Okay. So you might see it better from this side. I don't okay. know. Well, I don't want to, oh, this is dry. <laughs> this is a dry run. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just crank over, see what's happening. Twenty-three horsepower in a vehicle that probably weighs 3,000 pounds and all the weights over the back tires? Yeah. Bring seam on. I am ready. I am ready for the red carpet and I'm ready to set the world on fire. And you just make sure you get my insurance paid up. Accidents. This time on Graveyard Cars, the ghouls may have wrapped the big ticket items on the little dead wagon, but this little A100 isn't done yet. Cousin Dougie finishes the seats. The team stains, clears, cuts, and installs the wood slat truck bed. And with Springfield in the rear view, they head for SEMA in Las Vegas. But will an unforeseen problem put the brakes on Mark's red carpet dreams? It's real frustration, real disappointing. In Springfield, Oregon, Mark Warman, together with his skilled ghouls, it has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. Bring classic Mopar muscle cars back from the dead to look like they did the moment they left the factory floor. Because of the obvious threat, this station will remain on the air day and night. So we're getting ready to install the seats in the 1964 A100 Little Dead Wagon. I like looking at the camera, I guess kind of punches at home. Anyway, it's not the point, it's not all about me. These seats are customized. When it's all custom like this, I can anticipate some problems. My biggest fear will be that they set too high or they don't set right when they actually get bolted in. It is what it is, we gotta get to SEMA, so. 
One of the things I admire most about Doug is how he will take his time. When you take those seats, for example, that bolt doesn't thread in there by hand, he'll clean it up. He'll clean the bolt up, he'll run a thread chaser through it, run the tap in there, get those threads all cleaned up. He doesn't want to be in a situation, and most technicians are not this way. They'll just ram it in there with an impact gun. Doug takes his time, cleans it up, and makes sure that it's a sanitary install. So for all the crap that I give him about his weirdness and his mannequins and his strange brain, uh, he's actually a phenomenal tech. Seats really went in without too much trouble at all. Uh, again, this is a little bit different than what we're used to working on, so we did have to clean up some holes. We did have to find and locate the holes in the floor, that kind of a thing. But overall, it went really well. I'm glad that's done because now the seats are in it, we can set in it, we can set the height to figure out where the shifter is going to be, so we can really start moving forward with the wrap up. This 1970 Challenger RT features a 390 horsepower 446 pack engine. It's matched up with the legendary Hemi four speed transmission and all of that power is handled out back by a 410 Dana rear end. This is a factory SC7 plum crazy car and it's all numbers matching. In 1970, the Dodge Challenger RT came standard with a 335 horsepower 383 Magnum. Now there are three other options available at that time. The first one was engine code E86, and that was a 440 Magnum single four barrel engine that produced 375 horsepower. The second option was engine code E87, and that was a 446 pack, and that's featured here. And of course, last but not least, the Elephant, the 426 Hemi. That engine code is E74, and that produced a whopping 425 horsepower. This ultra rare Challenger is one of only 847 446 pack four speed 1970 Challengers made. And that makes this our Corpse of the Week. So on our little dead wagon, there are a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of choreography because there's only so much room for so many people. Now, the engine's in it, certainly that means the drivetrain's in it, but the wood has to be stained. We bought a really cool bed floor bed kit from Yogi's. We're staining it with a dark walnut and then we're using PPG clear over the top of that, so that's Will's job. Uh, the rest of the team are working on getting the stainless steel trimmed and fitted, cut and put into place for like the wheel tubs and the insides of the bed. We're pretty lucky to have a really cool metal shop right down the road from us. The guys at All Pro, they just roll out the carpet for us. They have all the brakes and all the slip rolls and everything that they're the ones really that are pre-cutting and pre-shaping a lot of the stainless steel that's going inside the bed. It's big pieces, so you know, inside that bed's six feet long and it has to have a certain shape and a certain contour to it. So when you're talking about clear coating over an impervious substrate like uh, metal, it doesn't take nearly as much paint because the paint has nowhere to go, it can't soak in. But this is wood. So that stain, while it goes on there and it soaks into the wood, the clear is coat after coat. Typically speaking, you would want to put three or four coats of clear on, let it set for a week, sand it, then re-clear it, and continue to do that until you had a nice flush finish. So the Little Dead Wagon has kind of been an ongoing change. And so from what I had envisioned originally to where it is even right now, is different. The basic structure of it is the same. It's a great big Hemi in the back of an A100 and it's painted red and it, you know, got a little dead wagon going onto it and all that stuff. But the stainless steel inside was more of an afterthought. Originally when I did it, I thought I would do body and paintwork inside of there. But as we started running out of time for SEMA and that date kept creeping forward, I thought, you know, the stainless would look pretty good and it will. Um, but it also saves me on my end a lot of time. It, the, the body and the paint that we'd have to do inside there would be an enormous amount of time. Frankly, we just didn't have that time. So the kit from Yogi's for the bed floor, I believe is for a regular eight foot bed. That doesn't leave us a lot of extra wood and a lot of extra stainless. It does leave us some, but what we've got to be careful of is making sure that when we make our cuts that we don't overcut. You can't put wood back on. You can keep taking it off, but you gotta be careful when you make your measurement and you make your cut. Now at the same time that you've got this specific piece of wood that needs to be say 54 inches long, maybe it only needs to be four inches wide and originally it's a six inch wide piece. So then we have to do a radial cut or a lineal cut down. That's where guys like Royal come in because he's done a lot of woodwork and so is our new greenhorn. Uh, but when you're done, you've gotta be able to stack this tongue and groove in together, 
with the stainless steel separators. They also have to be precision cut. You cut too far, you can't put it back on there. With no time left for SEMA, it's just a very crucial time, even though we're rushing, and normally you can make compromises in a rush, this stuff, you have to stop, take your time, not just double measure, triple, quadruple measure. You need to make sure it's right. I always measure wrong. You learn that these little hands are the best things you can do. I mean, you can take a tape measure to it, you can use a, a block of wood, you can take papers and roll them up, but the fact is, your fingers are pretty much the same on each hand, unless you're Dougie. God only knows what he's got. Well, I, can, I can measure, I could take a two by four that's four foot long, get another one, stand it up next to it, make a mark on it and cut it and it would be shorter. Why? Because I cut on the wrong side of the blade, Royal says. So that's why I'm not doing it. They, there is no room for that kind of stuff. No Mark Warmanisms in this one. You know, I, I watch a lot of car shows. I, I spent the last 15 years watching great shows like Overhauling. And I always thought to myself, eh, that's a crock, man. Nobody's under that kind of pressure. But they can be. They're under that pressure. And in this situation where you got SEMA just right around the corner and we're just now starting to put a bed floor in, it's so important that we don't make any mistakes because we can't next day out a whole nother kit that weighs 300 pounds, right? We have to take our time. But at the same time, one small mistake throws the whole game over. What are you going to put on the floor? Some carpet? You're going to throw some shag carpet in there? Call it a 70s unit? So yeah, you do have to make the right cuts and you have to make them every single time. When I bought the little A100, I knew that it was gonna be a little dead wagon. <laughs> Check it out. It's been a long process. Got a lot of time into it. A lot of time it just sat because we had other cars that we were working on. Also deciding exactly how I wanted it to look, making sure I had the right vendors lined up on a project like this. because. I've never really done a subframe like we had to do on this one. That's a lot of head scratching. That's a lot of thinking because it's not just cosmetic. If we don't do something right underneath there, somebody dies. Who's going to build the engine? Where are you going to get the engine? Who's going to build the transmission? Where are you going to get the transmission? The rear end, all these things. When you add them up and you sit down with a pen and paper and you start getting things coordinated, it takes a long time to build a car. And it's just a shame that all that prep and all that time and all those dedicated hours still come down, no matter how hard you try, to that last murderous week, hell week, where you're just doing back-to-back -back suicide shifts trying to knock one of these things out. Wait, maybe one day we'll have a perfect system and we won't have to do that. But right now, I don't know any way to avoid it. The 1970 Challenger RT was certainly born with the intention of going fast and looking cool. What high performance engine in the Dodge lineup for 1970 was not available in the Challenger RT model? Was it the 383 Magnum? The high performance 344 barrel? The 426 Hemi? Or none of the above? Do you think you know the answer? Stay tuned after the break and I'll let you know how you did. Okay, ghouls, how did you do? What high performance engine was never available in the 1970 Challenger RT model? If you guess none of the above, you're wrong. Sorry. The 383 Magnum, as we learned in our Corpse of the Week, came standard in the Challenger RT. The 440 Magnum and the 446 pack were optional, as was the legendary 426 Semi. However, the high performance 340 small block engine was never available in the RT model. The only way you could get that high winding little powerhouse was in a base model Challenger with the A66 option package. In fact, this package pretty much gave you all the good stuff that the RT had, but without the special price class designation of the RT. So this is actually one of my favorite parts of the whole thing. When I was a kid, I remember the little red wagon with all the cool decals down the side, and he had some I don't have. There were things, there were sponsors back in the day that were very big into racing, maybe that aren't as much today. What I tried to do was, number one, if they really truly were sponsors, and they were around back in 1964, I tried to use their original graphics. I tried to do replicas of the originals. So when you see like the Hearst shifter, now I wanted to have that one on there because that was been on many cars over the years. So the little Hearst logo is an original 1964 style. Milladon is a great sponsor. They worked with us on the oil pan, the oil cooling system, all kinds of things like that. But the decal I had to use on that is the only one that they've had, which is the modern day logo. Krager 
you look at that one on there, that's the one that was back on the trucks and on the race cars back in the day. This, to me, I look at it with the logos, with the lettering, everything, the wheels, the tires, the stance, the engine. I am looking at the model that I built when I was a little kid in my bedroom on 14th Street when I was about eight years old. So hopefully the rest of the world that remembers the vehicle and loved Bill Maverick and got to see him maybe in some cases live like I did up at Woodburn and PIR will really love the truck and hopefully it takes them and transcends them just back to a funner time in our lives when we were kids. So right now Mark is out doing his final test drive on the A100. You hear him pulling in right now, so we're gonna bring it in, do it once over on it, make sure we're good to go. That's a bad boy, bad boy. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when it comes for you? What do you think? How to run it. Good. Took it around the parking lot. Couldn't steer it. Front end was in the air. So it's, <laughs> so it's ready to go. It's ready to go. What do you think? It came out great. This thing is absolutely beautiful. It came out just like I wanted it to. It, it, it has so much of the spirit of the original one that I grew up watching. Everything I wanted from the beginning, from the time I first thought about it, first had the idea at SEMA a couple of years ago. No. <laughs> No, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This was my idea for us to build this. Well, long as you freaking do! Was it my idea? I did not know that. When we got back from the SEMA the year before, I said, hey, boss, this is what we got to do. Horrible idea. Literally horrible. I wanted no part of it. You knew it was my idea. No, I don't even remember you saying it. You I keep do. saying you did, but I don't believe you did. I thought it was, it was a joke. Like, he truly forgot. I have a delayed re learning response. Six months? <laughs> yeah, six months, yeah. This thing's awesome. The car came out great. We got it ready for SEMA. And it's ready for the red carpet. Absolutely gorgeous. Ray Barton builds the nastiest engine on the planet today. It has 923 horsepower on pump gas. And it fired right out. Yep. 871 blower shop blower, dual Holly carburetors. Just beautiful. That's, yep. That's a good feel to Got it. our Yogi Bear floor in there. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, no. is there anything you'd do differently? Not a thing. And look at the lettering Brenda did on that. I mean, just a local talent to, to capture the spirit of what I wanted, which was, I wanted it to look like the lettering and look the cartoony kind of a feel to right. it. It wasn't until she started putting the, the shadows on it right. that it really started to pop. No, this, this has that old school feel to it. Who's your Excel, eat my shift transmission guys? Johnny Lightning. Johnny Lightning was the original sponsor of their of the little red wagon. Oh, was it? Yep. We are going, and I didn't tell you this. This is the cool stuff. Notice my pistol grip shifter. Yeah. My crushed velvet tuck and roll interior. Oh, that was spawned from my brain. No, it wasn't. The mom used to, was cool. Mom used to say I had a fertile mind. You probably did at one point. No, I, I still agree. have a fertile mind. There's nothing wrong with my mind. You it's just said you were delayed. You know what I did is I did that for you because I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you just realized you, you come just, up with lies, just, no, and then no. I just tried to get you a back door out of it. You remember the red carpet last year with the Superbird? Actually, no. Oh, you weren't there. You didn't let us go. It's uh, a shame. <laughs> yeah, you'll be down there this year. They invited yes. us to go across the red carpet. Only one car gets invited to go across the red carpet, and you are looking at it. It's like. 100 cars. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Only one little dead oh, wagon yeah. this, well, with a 426 Semi really with dual Holly carburetors and okay. an 871 supercharger on it get to go across. That is correct. Yes. So, this will be the picking one. the fly poop out of the pepper, I'd say. No, you think we're ready? I think we're ready. I'm exhausted. See you in SEMA 2018. Litter dead wagon.
get ready, pack up, head out. You guys are flying down. I don't fly, I drive. It takes about 15 hours. I average about 80 miles an hour going down there. 2016 Challenger Shaker they still getting 22. Huh? They are. The people at home don't care. Oh, okay. I'm sorry I'm it's boring okay. you with what I'm going to actually do. It's Why don't we talk about how many beers you're going to drink while you're down there? Because they love to hear about that. They do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Drunk. Good comeback. Yeah. Yeah, you are. <laughs> so now that we got this all wrapped up, I'm going to go get packed. We're going to catch our flight, get down to Las Vegas, and make sure we're ready to go for the red carpet. Little Willy Willy can't block mud comes to the daddy for the daddy rescue. Ha <laughs> ha. He's ridiculous. He's so ridiculous. If you wanted to shave your <laughs> you could do it on the side of that vehicle. That's the so kind of So you can't reflection. even use that on TV. <laughs> Shaving your <laughs> on the truck. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't, I'm pretty sure. Okay, well we'll see in the final edit if makes it. Punchy been painting fumes too many years. It's 1978. You are about to start your senior year in high school. You worked all summer at the sawmill and you earned $800. Now, you're not Dougie, so your parents aren't going to co-sign for a more expensive car. You've got $800. A lot of beautiful Mopars in the world. You're at the coolest car lot in town. Obviously, you can't buy the Cuda, too much money. What you can buy is either the 1971 Dodge Demon 340 automatic transmission or the 1974 Cuda with a 360 and a four speed. Which car do you take home so you can go cruising on Friday night? Your opinion matters. Please go to graveyardcars.com and cast your vote. We will announce live on Facebook next week what you chose to drive. And as always, thanks for playing. So far, the ghouls knocked out the last items on their A100 punch list, installing the seats, the wood slat truck bed, and the stainless steel finish pieces. Still to come, the GYC team heads for SEMA, but will a problem with the little dead wagon spell disaster for its red carpet debut? That means the little dead wagon is dead. So I've got some side markers out in front of me. These are all off of a 1970 Dodge Challenger. It happens to be uh, the ones on this side are all original ones. The ones over here are the brand new Classic Industries ones. I wanted to point out that even when you have a really good condition original side marker, it isn't usually perfect enough to go into a car that's just had beautiful body and paint work on it. So the question is, do I send this out and do I have it re-chromed or do I pick up the phone and call Classic and just have them send me a brand new one? So we're gonna talk about how to make that decision. Now this is a rear side marker. You see I've got the red lens. Amber goes in the front, red goes in the rear. But we talk about the actual housing itself. If you go around the outer perimeter of it, overall, like I said, it's pretty darn clean. But if you get close, you'll see damages to the chrome. Like here's a slice where some kid on a bicycle went by and blasted it with his pedal probably. If it didn't have the dents, you still have to deal with the fact that this is pot metal that's been chromed and it was 50 years ago. So what happens to pot metal that's that old that's been chromed, it begins to bubble. And that bubbling is only gonna continue to get worse. Now, if you take that and you send it off to the chrome shop, they've gotta strip all the chrome off of it. The process of doing that can actually cause more problems to the pot metal. The pot metal actually could get holes in it or pinholes in it that it didn't have when it was in its chromed state. So anybody who's ever chromed for a living knows that pot metal is pretty much designed to be chromed one time. After that, you can end up chasing your tail around in circles. So this is a new housing. You think, well, okay, it's an aftermarket housing. I want an original part of my car. I understand that, I'm the same way. It's just what makes sense. If you look at this housing, this new one, you go around and you look at the same chrome that I showed you a minute ago. This is a brilliant, deep chrome. There's no pits or bubbles in it. There's no damage, obviously, it's a new part. But it's the exact same footprint as the original one. And I'll show you in a minute on the back. But just consider how close those are, if not exactly perfect. We turn them around and look at them. You have the Chrysler Pentastar because 
Classic licenses it through Mopar. We have our part number down at the bottom. We have our right hand insignia uh, cast into it. All of the SAE lettering and codes are on there. The original studs, everything on this housing is an identical twin to this housing, except it's not 50 years old and it looks a lot better than the original one. So to me, by the time you chrome this and got it back and hoped that it was perfect, you could probably buy three of these. So now you know what my thinking is when it comes to parts that have already passed my quality test. And that's what we're dealing with here is parts that I wouldn't put on the car unless I approved of them. You make your own decision. That's my advice. Right now we're down at the Las Vegas SEMA show, SEMA 2018. I drove down from Springfield, Oregon, took me about 14 hours. Mopar invited us back to their booth again. It's an honor, it always is an honor because, let's face it, I mean, that's the big guy, right? And so for us to be part of the adopted family is pretty, pretty cool. This year, I told them I was building the little dead wagon with the second generation 426 Hemi in it, and they wanted to put it in their booth. So we're down here setting that up. The red carpet's pretty cool. They take some of the really cool popular cars and kind of roll them across the stage before they head inside to get set up for their display. Uh, so Justin and I came down a day early, kind of go over the A100, make sure it was running, driving, ready to go. Got here early this morning, got right to the booth, and it wouldn't start. So after some trial and error, going through the whole thing, come to find out our fuel pump is no longer working. This pump is For real? Yeah. I had just, How does it ring? So we got it disconnected, like hit the switch, and we got nothing coming out of that. Yeah, market. nothing's coming out of it at all. It's fried. So right now we can't run the truck and we have about 45 minutes before we're doing the red carpet. And the reason we're running around sweating, it's hot as hell in here. So I think that the fuel pumps probably not pumping, it's running, but it's not pumping anything. So Mopar has this, I think, 345 horse crate engine. Remember when they built the one up last year, they just used regular fuel pump on it? So it's got an electric fuel pump inside there that's regulated up to 60 pounds for this, but we can regulate it down for ours. And it's got six AN fittings on it. So they're, I think they're coming over to take the pump out and then hand it to us and we're going to put it in ours. Well, so the two wires that go to ours will yeah. have to go over to theirs. Okay. And I imagine he's connected those in a different way, but they've got tools here. They've got everything. Great. When I got here, the battery was dead. Uh, we've had this thing dialed in for three or four days, and it not once had, had a battery issue. Mopar had a uh, display unit here, knew the urgency of everything, the time frame, the crunch that we had, and uh, they said, hey, here you go. Take apart what you need. And that was, that was pretty rock star right there on that one. Awesome. So whatever we're going to need to be able to get that in, we've got to do it quick if we're going to make it to the red carpet. Yeah. And I think what it's going to do is we're going to draw off of just one tank right now, just to get over there and back, and leave the other one connected so it doesn't bleed out. That's what I'm hoping. That's, that's the goal. We'll see what's getting there. It's actually taking one of their engines, and it's complete. And they're letting us take the fuel pump off of it right now, so we can put it on our truck for tonight's event. Right now, we have 30 minutes to get this off and get it installed. It's going to be a long shot, but Justin's working on it right now, so I think there is a chance we can get it done. I have a suspicion that whoever moved it into the Mopar booth last night left the fuel pump on because there's, there's, no, there's nothing that says fuel pump or off or on, so it'd be easy to leave it on. Because this morning when Will got here, the battery was completely dead. It's a brand new 127 battery. The switch was off. But I think somebody came around and realized what they had done later. But I think that pump running all night without a shutoff valve on it took the pump. It is a different fuel pump, but it's still the same style. Two wires, it runs, nothing fancy. Um, it's just a matter of, we didn't come down here with a ton of tools. I just kind of put what I thought we might need in my little Disneyland backpack. And uh, we're trying to muscle through it right now. We have the fuel pump in there. Um, the problem we're running into is they use bigger fittings than what we used. So at this point, we're trying to see if we can just bypass all of our system completely and go with their setup all the way through and try to get it good enough just to get it to the red carpet tonight. It is 1.45, we have 15 minutes. 
Um, it's just been one problem after another. We've always been able to overcome everything over the past couple months. That means a little dead wagon is dead. We just found out that we're not going to be able to get this truck running and on stage for the red carpet event. So uh, instead, we're getting ready to raise it up in the air, put it on the stand so it can be up on display. Everybody will enjoy it. It's just kind of disappointing that we couldn't get to the actual red carpet event. I guess we spin up our mask, get the forklift, because we still need to get this thing jacked up. And yep. And we'll talk tomorrow. All right. It's real frustrating. Real disappointing. So at this point, we're basically just kind of buttoning it back up. We're going to get it lifted four feet up in the air, and then we're going to go out and have a drink. We're going to hit Fremont Street. We're done. Uh, we get ready to do all of our autographs. that Dodge made several high-performance engine options in the 1970 Challenger. True or false? Only 974 Dodge Challengers equipped with a 446-pack engine and a four-speed transmission were produced in 1970. Do you think you know the answer? Stay tuned after the break and I'll let you know how you did. How'd you guys do? Did Dodge really only make a total of 974 446 pack four speed challengers in 1970? If you guessed yes, well, you're wrong again. What the heck? Were you guys not paying attention to Corpse of the Week? The total production of 446 pack four speed challenger RTs in 1970 is 847. So now you know. There's two things that I have to do at SEMA. Number one is keep the tradition of starting at 426, and we did that. Number two is to always make sure we bring a big announcement, and trust me, I have one. And speaking of concepts, I know that you know that there is something special under this cover over here. I don't know what kind of car is under the cover on the stage, but I'm anxious to find out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the 1968 Dodge Supercharger Concept. The Concept Supercharger is a good looking car. They just wanted you to see what a Concept Charger could look like should they do something like that down the road. Honestly, I think this car is awesome. It's bringing the old school and the new school together, which for my generation is gonna make us fall in love with Mopar all over again. A lot of cool things to it. Love the color, a lot of, a lot of modifications that were really cool. Overall, it's gorgeous. I like it. I'm sure Mark loves it too. I think they'd be missing the boat if they didn't build something close to that. They did it with the Challenger, proved it can be done, took old world influence, put it into a new generation car that met all of the safety regulations and EPA and all that. They can do it again. They can do it with a Charger. That sucks that this is a car that's not going to go into production and that it's only a concept car. Can we like start a GoFund page or something? get a thousand signatures, we can make it. Mopar's great at everything they do. Uh, one, one really cool thing was the way they ran their exhaust through the taillights. Um, that's just that next level that you don't really think about. Um, that's just thinking outside the box when you're doing a creative build like that. I, I thought it was executed really nice. You know, I wasn't here back in the 70s, so it's a big catch-up game. Uh, my generation liked a lot of the modifications, uh, kind of making their cars their own. So seeing the two worlds come together is pretty awesome. I have to put a firewall in my brain and just say, there's old world original, that's my heart and that's my passion, but you got to open the door to new ideas. So the Supercharger is a very modified, well done, but very modified Charger that I, I wouldn't probably invest the time into doing for myself, so it's not really my cup of tea. But I think the world loves it. I think the world would buy them like hotcakes if they came out. I think, I think it's super cool. It's different than anything else they have on the streets, and I think that that would be awesome if they put it into production. A little too extreme for my taste on certain things, but it's still a beautiful car, and uh, they should be really proud of what they built. So I don't know exactly, but it's my hunch that in the next few years we could see something like that. And if they made it in burnt orange, I'd order the first one off the assembly line.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the head of Mopar North America, Steve Beam. One of the things I'm looking forward to is that 426 in the afternoon, they always have their press release on the first day of the show. So they've asked me to be out in the audience because they want to surprise me, I guess. If you're a SEMA regular, you may have been expected to be greeted by someone with an Italian accent. So our good friend Pietro actually moved up and now he's uh, working with Mopar on a global level. So now we have a new guy named Steve we're getting to work with. So I think it's time for me to address the elephant in the room. All right, I think it is. You know, this year's super, super exciting. They have a surprise for Mark. Um, we don't know what it's gonna be. So over the last few years, Mopar has uh, been excited uh, with words like horsepower, hemicrate engines, hell crate. Mopar has a big surprise. Hasn't told us, hasn't told Mark. So I'm kind of anxious to see what it is. We're always looking for that extra ounce of performance. And the good news is we found it. So I know that my dad has no idea what the surprise is going to be for Mopar because he's going around to everybody and trying to get information from them. And you may have seen her teasers, by the way, on social media. And as you watched, you knew something big was coming. Well, the wait is over. The fact that they kept me out of it, I know it's a big release. All right, introducing another first for Mopar. Plug and play, 1,000 horsepower, Mopar 426 supercharged elephant crate Hemi engine. I had no idea that they were about to unveil the most incredible crate engine in the history of the world. That's right, this Mopar elephant crate Hemi engine delivers a staggering 1,000 horsepower along with 950 pound-feet of torque. This elephant is a beast. 1,000 horsepower, four-digit horsepower in a crate with a controller running on 93-octane pump gas. Back in the day, it cost you $25,000 to build a motor with that much horsepower, and you couldn't run it on pump gas. If Chevy and Ford can say whatever they want, they, the game is over. Who got the checkered flag? Mopar. Well, we'd like to think the elephant is a very special gift and all the performance lovers out there, but what's a gift if you can't open it up and play with it? So I think we should fire this thing up. I also think we should bring Pietro back up to help me fire this thing up. It was fun to see Pietro again. I only get to see him once a year. Uh, that guy is all over the globe non-stop in a plane constantly. So excited to be here once more, once here again. And, uh, and by the way, Steve, there is a good friend of Mopar in, uh, here at SEMA. Uh, he has been my partner in crime for a couple of years, and I, he is a true, true, true Mopar, Mopar enthusiast. I mean, we have a little discussion about who invented Mopar or no car, but I think I will take uh, Mark was on stage with us. Come on up, Mark. Where are you at? There he is. Mopar, no car. Yeah. Mopar, no car. So they did bring me up on stage. I'm up there with the global president of Mopar and the U.S. president of Mopar. And here's little old Mark Warman. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's mental. As always, yeah. they told you to walk in front of the car and you can <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. Who else would do How this other than Mopar, right? Oh. So. That's what mental. do you guys think? Let's, uh, why don't you help me get this thing fired oh, we're up, starting right? It, right? I Take the fire marshal 15 minutes to get here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in my motel room. Uh, Start it. All right, I'll so on it. the count of three, guys, help me. Yeah. One, two, two three. three. Now the fire marshal is going to come. There, there you go. go. Oh, listen to that. Listen to that. Come on, now give it a round. Yeah! Woo! Get it free! <laughs> Woo! Awesome! Oh, all right. Now that's real. Yeah. That sounds beautiful to my ears. Oh, it's unbelievable. That's beautiful. That's Mopar style. That is what Mopar's done ever since yeah. it started. <laughs> They're amazing how they keep secrets here from you. I, I don't know how many, that many people can keep a secret. Hey, and, Mo it. and Mark, since you're a good friend of Mopar and a good friend of Pietro, I'm gonna consider you a friend of mine. And Thank by you. the way, that engine's yours. You can use it in one of your project cars coming up. How about that? Are you serious? I'm serious. Is he not that engine I've never seen him speechless 
but about twice, and I think that was the second time. I had no idea that it was coming, and, and, and if you're at home, you go, it's an engine. I get that. It isn't that. It isn't it's the first engine. It's that Mark Warman was recognized for something that he's so passionate about. Wow! Serious? Yeah, seriously, it's yours. Oh, well, so, okay. So let's get off the stage for the far... <laughs> I could take it now? Yeah. If you could yeah. carry it on your back, you can take it. At the end of the show. That's crazy. This serious? It's Thank it's you. It's yeah. it's I didn't know. That's cool. That's, so anyway, uh, everyone, please help us celebrate the Elephant's 1,000 horsepower. It's a long way to get here. And so to be here and recognized by the leader in, in cool performance, Mopar, somebody you've spent your life dedicated to fixing and repairing and, and promoting, doesn't get a lot better. So, as always, it's more no car or, or no, no car. car. Thanks, everyone. He was pretty excited. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. That's <laughs> oh, man. I did not know I was getting that. I think we got more done on the Dodge 100 in two weeks than we did in the first year. Every trip to SEMA is better than the trip before. It's disappointing that we didn't get to go across the red car, but you wouldn't know because you didn't want to go down there. You took your, Ducky took his vacation while I went down to SEMA. While the cat's away, the rooster will play. <laughs> but we had, a, we had a good time down there. Uh, we didn't get a chance to go across the red carpet because the fuel pump was left on and got destroyed overnight. But the good news is the fans absolutely loved it. It was sitting at the front of the show. Mopar, once again, amazingly, I don't know how they are able to keep these stupid secrets from me. Maybe I'm just not connected. Maybe I'm not the Circle Trust. But the fact is, they gave me the very first 1,000 horsepower all aluminum third generation 426 semi built. The first one. So you know what that means? That's awesome. It, it does mean it's awesome. Uh -huh. It also means we've got to come up with a very, very special carport to go into. And I have an idea. I bet you do. I do. I'll I bet it's it. going to be a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. If I can pull it off, it'll be the biggest event at SEMA 2019 in the history of the SEMA show. I may be outside the circle of trust, but in my little world, my little pond, I'm the big fish that runs it. And nobody can keep a secret. Tony Philly Steak. D'Agostino is sniffing around to come out and check up on his car, right? <laughs> yeah. So I got that word yesterday. I told the camera guys to make sure they put their great big wide lenses on. Cameras, we don't want to miss any, right? <laughs> told them the big ragu is coming. Remember the big ragu? Uh-huh. Yeah, that was for Laverta Shirley. The big ragu is on his way. Uh -huh. I'm not saying he's fat, all right? But his high school graduation picture, it was an aerial photograph. Yeah? Uh -huh. Maybe we can do lunch. Yeah, Billy steak sandwiches? Yeah, that'd be good. Why don't you guys go to lunch? And okay. if I'm out there in five minutes, you start without me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>